It's Tuesday, it's 12.15 and we're live in Westminster. The new Reform UK leader, Nigel Farage, calls for zero net migration. We were told that we get control of our borders. We were told the immigration numbers would come down. They have exploded. A vote for reform opens the door to a Labour government, and a Labour government would just open the door and wave people through into our country. The Conservatives promised to introduce an annual cap on migration in the face of devastating polls for the party. The Liberal Democrats are also hoping to knock the Tories with a plan to provide free personal care for adults. If we do that, we rescue our NHS. Our NHS is on its knees. Tonight, Rishi Sunak and Keir Starmer go head to head for the first time in a TV debate. And with big names stepping down from Parliament, we'll look at the anticipated changing of the guard at Westminster. Joining us today, Minister for Legal Migration, Tom Purseglove, Labour's Harriet Harman, Moya Lothian McLean from the left-wing media outlet Navara Media, and founder of Conservative Home, Tim Montgomery. This is Politics Live Election 2024. Welcome to viewers on BBC Two, BBC iPlayer and BBC News. Uh, let's start uh, with Nigel Farage's return to frontline politics by standing, announcing that he's standing at the election. Uh, let's take a look at the front pages, uh, starting with the Daily Mail. Double blow for Sunak, Rishi's darkest hour. This is how The Guardian has got it Tory alarm as Farage takes control of Reform UK. This from the Daily Telegraph, I'm back to lead the revolt. And Daily Express, vote for Farage is more likely to end up with Starmer in number 10. Um, and in the last 15 minutes or so, Nigel Farage has launched his campaign. He's standing in Clacton. We'll uh, show you the other candidates who are standing so far in just a moment. But first of all, Tim, what impact is Nigel Farage's return or standing in this election going to have on the Conservative Party? Well, first of all, on the campaign itself, I think it electrified it. I think it's been a dull campaign. I think we know what the result is going to be, a Labour government. And suddenly there's controversy, there's interest in it. For the Conservative Party, I thought the best thing that uh, Rishi Sunak did by calling that early surprise election was discombobulate reform. They weren't ready. Nigel Farage said he wouldn't stand, and I thought that was to the Conservatives' advantage. Him standing yesterday in a way that hogged all of the headlines, dominated social media, has turned what could be a, a very significant Conservative defeat into a rout. We had that poll yesterday from YouGov on mm. Sky News, which talked about only 140 Conservative MPs surviving. I think with Nigel Farage in the battle, I think, I don't know what Tom would say, but I think if, the, if Tom could take 140 seats now, that would certainly be, most of his colleagues would absolutely take 140 at the moment. Uh, what's uh, your response to Nigel Farage? What impact is it going to have on your campaign? Obviously, Nigel is a big character, isn't he? We all know that. And I've worked with him in the referendum campaign, so I know Nigel a little bit. The problem is that if you want to sustain Brexit, if you want to see migration continue to fall, and we've got a plan, it's delivering results, that 300,000 reduction in net migration, the only way that you will get that is with Conservatives as your members of Parliament and with a Conservative government. All of that is off the table with Labour. No credible plan to cut net migration. The right. Rwanda flights won't go. It would be a disaster to vote reform because you simply will get the opposite of what you want. Right. Well, we can see pictures here. It's a media scrum, actually. It's quite difficult to see uh, Nigel Farage here launching his campaign in Essex in Clacton. Um, Harriet Harman, he has also pledged, of course, to hold Labour's feet to the fire um, when it comes to those former red wall seats that Labour are hoping to win back. How worried are you? Well, I think the reality is, is that for that really reform is going to take votes away from the Conservatives, not from Labour. Um, but actually, having said that, Labour people are not being complacent. I'm slightly struggling at the moment because I'm supposed to be not fizzing with enthusiasm and being utterly complacent. But the opinion polls are so absolutely strong. But when all <laughs> said and done is that we do have a mountain to climb. You know, the Conservatives won 162 more seats than Labour at the last election. So people are rightly very focused and concerned and working hard, but it looks like reform is going to help Labour because it's going to take votes away from the Tories. Moya, what do you think the impact will be of Nigel Farage standing in this election? I think it will be lesser 
on the actual result in Parliament than it will be on the discourse and the way we talk about politics and uh, policy in the public sphere. For example, if you look at the polling, it says that reform are probably going to return about two seats in the country, which is, you know, so much less than the impact they're having on the discourse around it. You looked at that mob in Clacton on Sea surrounding Nigel Farage. Um, and I think when you also look at the places where reform have already stood, such as the local elections, they'd had a much lesser result than the Greens. I don't see the Greens being mobbed by journalists all the time or being invited on the Today programme to But it might be the impact of splitting the vote, for example. It might split the vote, but you look at, again, you look at Rochdale by election, somewhere where reform stood a candidate, and you look at the, uh, the Workers' Party who won that election. They actually have a, quite a similar agenda to reform on migration, on cultural issues, uh, such as, you know, LGBTQ people um, and the way they've been demonised, and also climate change. But they won that election when reform came sixth, and you have to ask, why did the Workers' Party win that election when reform with a similar agenda didn't, and it's because there are differences in the robustness of the foreign policy. Well, I, I'll tell you why Nigel Farage is getting the attention that he is, rather than the Greens or the Lib Dems. Or the because <laughs> the most important thing that's happened in British politics in the last generation is Brexit. Yes, and, and he... one man, more than anyone else, made that happen. And, the... and that's why he's getting the attention, because the people, I think, know that when the spotlight is on him or when he has the opportunity to speak to the country, the electorate moves. And... I think we saw excitement yesterday in the election that we hadn't seen before. Are you Terrible. moved? Are you moved by Nigel Farage? If I was in Clacton, I'd vote for him. But you're not in Clacton. I'm not in Clacton. I will vote Conservative. Well, I mean, that will this, worry you, surely, Tom. But there is this terrible irony, isn't there, that voting for Nigel and reform will see all of the things that they're campaigning on done away with. You know, Brexit would be wound back under a Starmer government. And what I'm finding on doorsteps, particularly in Corby and East I'm sure there's a lot of undecided voters and there's a lot of people saying that they're undecided but they don't want Labour. I would really implore those people who want to see the progress sustained to vote for us. All right, well, let me just show you this MRP. We've been talking about the polls of the 2024 general election shows Labour winning a majority of 194, larger than even Tony Blair's landslides. You can see there Labour on 422, up 220 from the general election. Conservatives on 140, down by 225. Now, it uses MRP, uh, detailed demographic uh, detail to predict the outcome of individual seats. It's a very sophisticated uh, way of actually polling uh, public opinion. Does it feel like 1997? Well, I'm, uh, as I say, I'm trying not to mm -hmm. let myself get run away with this, but I do remember the first Parliamentary Labour Party meeting after 1997. There was not a room big enough in the House of Commons for us to all meet. We had to go to Church House. But is Church House even going to be big enough at the result of this election? But I mustn't be arrogant be, and count the votes. I've got to be, to be, I mustn't be complacent. Your pager you know, is buzzing I know, on the truth belt. is <laughs> our candidates are not complacent because getting people to change their mind from what they voted last time, getting them to trust you when they didn't trust you last time. It is a big task. So I'm going to try and keep my mouth shut. I know I'm here to speak. No, but you've I'm got to try, speak on the programme. I try and not um, get over complacent. And they are working incredibly hard. And if I could just say, the mm. when the election was called, it was absolutely extraordinary because I was like looking around to talk to my colleagues and there was no Labour MPs there. They'd all bang, they'd all gone out, not to their own constituencies, but to the constituencies they were twinned with to get rid of Conservative MPs. And all the Tory MPs were all there, hugging each other and crying and saying goodbye oh. like at a funeral. It was extraordinary how depressed and miserable they were they were, and ours were in the field, they were putting their videos out, and it seems like Rishi Sunak has taken his own party by surprise, but ironically, right. we've been ready. Actually, I should really retire from this programme, because I'm not doing the... Com you know, I'm doing... <laughs> you I'm are. Really I think you sound more excited than perhaps you've said, but what about morale, morale in the Conservative Party it must be rock bottom. We're getting out there and grafting, and there's lots of our candidates who've been putting in a real shift for a long time. Of course we had to do our job in Parliament, we had to make sure that the measures that we could get delivered through the wash-up were delivered, including important parts of our agenda. But we're full square in campaigning mode, working hard for every vote, taking nothing for granted, but also having clear policies about what we would do, which I think marks us out from Harriet's party. I mean, but, but just to underline the feeling amongst Conservatives, I mean, Tim has just said on air, on Politics Live, that if he were a constituent in Clacton, you would vote for Nigel Farage. I mean, what impact do you think that is going to have on Conservatives, 
on Conservative candidates and Conservatives in that constituency. And I mean, are they going say to expel you from the Conservative Party for that? Well, I'm not a member of the Conservative oh, that's Party right, anymore, oh, right, so they okay. can't so expel me. So he's not a member, but why are we right. asking him why we wouldn't vote for a Conservative if he's not a member of the Conservative Party? That makes yeah. no sense to me. He's not representative of the current no, Conservative Party. I, I would vote for Edward Lucas in Cities of Westminster, a brilliant Liberal Democrat candidate. I'd vote for Theon uh, Dabonair in Bristol against the Green candidate. I think a lot of us now are beyond voting for parties um, because... No, with all due respect to Tom, I think Tom is a really sincere public servant. But his promises on immigration made today, all of us can remember David Cameron 10 years ago or more saying, no ifs, no buts, we're going to bring immigration down to the tens of thousands. And we are further away from that target than we were when Harriet Harman left office. And that is the problem, really. And so I would vote for Nigel Farage in Clacton as a protest vote. Not because I particularly believe in everything that Nigel Farage stands for, but I just think the Conservative Party absolutely deserves the kicking that's I coming for it. And I say that with no relish whatsoever. But unfortunately, Tom, you haven't delivered, and not just on immigration, but a whole range of other issues. We are further away from the kind of Britain I thought we all believed in than when we were a few <laughs> years ago. I'll come to you, but I must let Tom just respond. But the thing is, Tim, that those measures that I've been taking forward are delivering on precisely the thing that you want to see. You want to see a fall in migration. We've lived in unprecedented times. We've been very generous and rightly in response to various international crises. The experts say that unaided, the numbers would fall quite considerably. With our measures that are seeing the fall that we anticipated, that 300,000, they're coming down more and more. I wouldn't put that at risk. But Moya? the trouble well, is, uh, it's, like a, it's like an emperor's new clothes moment. Nigel Farage has said the Tory emperors on immigration They've got no clothes. Right. It's strict. Well, we're going to hang on. Was right on anything. We're going to talk. We're going to talk about immigration in a little bit more detail. But first I of all, say I don't understand how a vote for Nigel Farage is a protest vote because everything the Tories are doing right now has been in part directed by Nigel Farage and his pressure cooker over that. He's been in politics since the 1990s, pushing these single issues again and again and again. Before Brexit Party, it was UKIP. Before Reform, it was Brexit Party. Mm. He's constantly banging on immigration. The Tories are backed into a corner on their migration policy because of Nigel Farage. And then he gets to come along and you say this is a protest vote. It's not a protest vote. You're voting for the same thing again and again and again. It will never be enough. First, it was Brexit. And, oh, that wasn't actually delivered properly. And then, now it's going to be the ECHR. But well, I'm when will it stop? He will never be satisfied because he is a constant wrecker. And I, the idea I, that he is going to deliver what's best for Britain when he has no... He and Reform have no ideas beyond this single issue. They have no coherent ideology is actually laughable. Uh, it's upsetting. Our right. infrastructure is rotting. I, and he's I, here I talking about... Let's him respond and then I, I'll I'll tell you when it will be enough when we have controlled immigration. Do we yes, not have control? We took control back. The, we Conservative took control back. the Conservative Party have promised control of immigration. Well, the, what more do you been, want, him? I want right. more than a promise. You need to be realistic. I, on, I want delivery. And that's what's the well, has ruined happened. this country. Let's talk about well. Let's country. talk about whether delivery is possible. It hasn't been so up until now by your own metrics. Um, and let's bring in Reform UK's deputy leader David Bull because actually Nigel Farage announced when he was standing that he called the election the immigration election. Well, he would say that. Reform would say that. He wants net migration to be zero. So in other words, the number of people leaving uh, the country would be equal to those coming in. How can it be done? David. Um, well, good to see you. I mean, listening to all of you on the panel, apart from Tim, actually, there's a massive disconnect between what you're saying, the metropolitan elite are saying, and what people are saying in the country. People are sick and tired of the fact they don't recognise this country. And when we hear from Tom things like, oh, immigration is coming down, well, the record has been woeful, and everything is attached to immigration. Look, I'm a doctor by training. The health service simply cannot cope. We have 20 million people on a primary and secondary waiting list. No one can get any houses built. Uh, they can't afford to go to a home. The cost of living has increased. The schools are oversubscribed. So everything essentially comes back to immigration. Now, right. just looking at those pictures from Clacton, Nigel is being greeted as a hero. His latest popularity ratings amongst our voters are higher than the king himself. All right, Don't David, underestimate David, us. hang on. I just want to get Tom to respond, first of all, to your claims on bringing down levels of migration. This is your fault, non-delivery of the promises that you made. The fact is, David, that we have a package of measures that will reduce net migration by 300,000. The stats are out month to month. 
what we're seeing is a fall. For example, student dependence down by 80 percent. But Tom, the applications, Tom, Tom, Tom. The, this is um, all legal migration. So it went yeah. from 745,000 to 685,000. You say the plan is working. There is no plan. But we have responded quite rightly as a country to crises in Ukraine, the situation in Afghanistan, the situation in Hong Kong. To cheap we saw a labor. need for additional social care workers, and it was right that we provided that workforce for social care reasons. But the experts are saying that the numbers will fall organically now, but with our measures it goes even further so, and the so evidence Tom, is very clear. 25% what, reduction your message? What is your message to, Hang on a minute. What is the message to the voter who cannot see a doctor, who cannot get housing, who feels the infrastructure in this country is falling apart? Nigel said, and quite rightly yesterday, nothing works in this country. Right, You've well, had 14 Tom, years Tom to do this. Well, let Tom respond. But that's precisely why our policy announcement goes further than our 300,000, but taking proper account of all of those factors. What is your we policy? The announcement. Well, what we've said is that the Migration Advisory Committee should have a look every year at all of the relevant factors in terms of housing, pressures on health, the needs in our economy, but also we want to really but, focus but, on domestic Tom, employment. You, you, for you failed. You're a high yeah. migration party, and that may be a good thing, but you are a high migration party uh, because you haven't met any of uh, the promises that you've made, rightly mm. or wrongly. The majority of uh, people coming here are coming on work visas legal migration, because you obviously feel there are shortages in uh, various parts of the workforce. So why would anyone trust you, if that's what they want to see, bring down levels of net migration? Because we have an actual plan to do it, right. and it's got all of the sort of levers. Actually, Brexit has given us those levers. We will lose those levers if we backslide on Brexit. But Being able why, to make the changes that I've announced is precisely so because... You, you, you well, we have been the, doing it over the last... You pursued the Rwanda policy. Time. That's where most of the parliamentary... But that's time illegal. Done, that's what that's the government illegal, illegal migration. We don't but, have a concern. And that, and that, and that isn't even going to be tested before the election. All right. Well, let me come so to Harriet. Let me come to Harriet because Harriet. Um, uh, can I just respond to something that you so can? But perhaps that David said about the NHS mm. because he's talked about the pressures on the NHS. Mm. If you take midwives, for example, there is more people from abroad helping deliver our babies than there sure. are actually migrants having babies. And if we want to have mm. more my, uh, midwives who are actually from this country and trained in this country, we need to provide bursaries which the Tories abolish we need to provide no, no, no. childcare there's loads of women who want to train and be midwives but that's all been cut away and as a result there's been immigration of midwives and thank God they've come to help us but actually you've got to have a plan Absolutely. to train up and support the workforce and you know as I say there's more people actually standing by helping the hospital beds than there are immigrants lying in them so you know thank you to the immigrants for the NHS right, and so let's let train some more doctors well, let's ourselves. Just ourselves. Let, to may I just counter that so we only have 123,000 doctors in this country 8,800 GPs are going to leave with by 2030 now, the cap has been increased by the government. We need to train more of our own people. But how long will but that also, take, David? It, just, just in terms of reading our contract with the people, by the way, it's a contract, it's not a manifesto. We want to take all frontline staff, medical staff, nursing staff, doctors, out of the basic rate of tax. We believe that is a pay rise of about 6% overnight. I agree with Harriet that in the interim, we have to import people right. from abroad. But actually, we've got 9 million people who are economically inactive. In in this country. But, and what we need to do on, is David, pay more and make sure on, people are trained on, in this hang country. On. But David, you have just there admitted that we still need labour from abroad because there are shortages. Nigel Farage has said, well, perhaps we'll have to live with shortages. Are you going to really sell that to constituents across the country? No, say, we we'll said, live without midwives, no, or we'll we live said. without really care workers, or we'll live without the requisite number of all sorts of trades that are intrinsic to the economy? No, we did not say that. So what we've said is there's a transition period. But actually, I think the point is really valid, which is when you've got nine million people e economically inactive in this country, something is going desperately wrong. I want to see social care workers paid far more. I want to see doctors and nurses paid far more. I know what it's like to be a junior doctor. It's hideous at the, be at the best of times. All right, but well, we let, also need to on. look after them. All there right, needs to be pastoral care. Let me bring in our other guest, Nigel Moya. Farage said this morning on the Today programme that he wanted to cut net migration, legal migration to yep. zero. zero. And he net said... Zero. Net zero. 
Why are you making a joke about net zero? And <laughs> he also could not define what a skilled worker was at this stage. And what, they, what he said yesterday was nothing works in this country. He said infrastructure is broken. Correct. He's but right. if you look at the workers that we are short of, they are all people who are vital to the infrastructure of this country. So because as Harriet pointed out, the route, David, let me finish. Yeah. But in the example in the Financial Times today, there was a whole report about how new infrastructure projects, ranging from you know data centres to wind farms to building new homes, are being held up by a shortage of construction workers. And the people, if you look at Manchester's Carp Live Arena, the, the owner of that said the reason we haven't been able to open four different times, four mm. failed attempts, they paid workers two times, three times more than is the normal rate. So and they couldn't find people because there was like hundreds of thousands of people yeah. short. We don't right. have the apprenticeships. We don't have the training. The cost of living is further going to decimate these... But why should the people so trust Labour? Now, hang on, Harriet. Why okay. should people trust Labour on their pledge to bring down significantly, Yvette Cooper said, the Shadow Home Secretary, she wants to be Home Secretary, bring down significantly the levels of net migration? because we've got a plan for actually training and apprenticeships and skills so that people who are economically inactive at the moment and want to be actually able to work can do those jobs. So why not put skilled. a number? Why not put a number on it? I mean, because is it going to be 10 people? Is it going, going to be 1,000, no. 100,000? No, we're, absolutely hang on, yeah. we're not going to put a number on it. Can I just say something about David's back to the 1950s? No, I want to just continue oh. on this because what <laughs> people want to know is what this back plan is of Labour. What is your plan to bring down those levels of okay. you said okay. about him that you said about investment okay. but Labour also announced the pledge to draw up skill improvement plans in high migration sectors what does that mean it means investment in people in training in the infrastructure of training and actually it's like there's been a cap on the number of doctors there's been the abolition of the midwives bursaries as I've said there's no skills training for people in the building industry okay. and we have to and the reason why we're not putting a cap on it is because it will not be possible to see immediately what the ah, numbers are going so to be and we're not going to make promises that we can't keep like the Tories did but why? in 2010 well, but 2016 you, but the key 2019 I think, actually, for you Harriet, for the Labour Party is, there is a package of measures that's reducing legal migration by 300,000. All of those measures are in flight. They're bringing the numbers down. Will you stick to them? Will you commit to them? Are you going to see that package through in the later stages of it? I would hope you would, but there's absolutely no visibility on your plan on that at all. Yes or no? It's really simple, isn't it? Hang on, hang on, let her answer. And it's just, I find it quite odd when... I mean, and I really sympathise with your, uh, you know, position, Tom, and I know you've, you know, done... But what's the, the answer kind of to his quite, question? Is that... The Tories have got no basis or credibility to challenge us when they've done the absolute opposite of everything they would say they were going to do. So, I mean, he asked me the question, and I'm sure you do a great job as a radio interview, but as a minister, you just have not delivered to the people well, what you've promised. I must say something about Britain in the 1950s. The in a minute, in a minute. Okay. So, that, so that is a very opaque answer. There's you, no yes The numbers or no. have gone you zooming up. You measures? said tens of thousands and it was up to 700,000. I mean, that is just... Well, why should anybody... Harriet, why do you want to bring the numbers down? You've just given an extremely because, passionate defence yeah. of the fact that our hospitals, without the midwives that are brought in from abroad, mm. you know, wouldn't function properly. Because why do you want to bring down... Why don't you make the argument for higher levels no, of migration. Because there are, uh, you know, there are mums here who've had their kids and who want to get back into work, who've got a passion to be a midwife, they want to have childcare, they want to have a training bursary and they can't. But let me just say something about the 1950s Briefly. and the reform thing, is that they are, with this net migration, you know, we're in a globalised world now. Britain to prosper needs to be able to see other countries and be part of the international world. And oh. I remember the 1950s, we couldn't even have olive oil except as something for your throat the, in a chemist. And the everybody had to be cooking I mean, in lard. Sort of no, way it was a well. very <laughs> narrow, <laughs> introspective thing. And we don't, we have All right, no well, let, Tom, let Tom like respond that. because we're going to have to move on fairly soon. To be International. That's a very long way of, a windy way of padding out having no credible policy on this. The fact is, there's no target, no credible plan about reducing net migration. And we know what the party's instincts are. Keir Starmer's letter was very clear on to EU free movement. Right, just briefly Great. before we move on, uh, David, you and the Reform are advocating mm. that uh, the UK leaves the European Convention on Human Rights. Indeed. That's correct. Yes. Um, just, to get, just to get a response, is that going to be in your manifesto, Tom? We obviously have a legislative basis that delivers the flights to Rwanda. That was one of the things that we legislated. But that's not my question. Are you going to advocate, would you Rwanda like to see leaving the ECHR as part of your manifesto? 
I don't think that that is necessary. Right. Obviously, yes, manifestos will be published, but the fact is we have a legislative basis upon which we can deliver those Rwanda flights in July. They will happen. If we're not in government, they'll be scrapped. That's not the right answer on illegal migration. We've got to get on and do those flights. David Bull, thank you very much for joining us today from Reform. Let me just show you the candidates who are standing so far in Clacton in Essex. We're going to move on and talk about social care because it's one of those issues that parties of all stripes have promised to fix and reform. Well, it hasn't really been talked about by the main parties, but today, BBC News, Liberal Democrats pledge free personal care for adults. Um, they'd introduced free personal care in England, uh, a similar system to the one that operates currently in Scotland. Let's talk to Daisy Cooper, the Liberal Democrats' deputy leader, and she speaks for the party on health and social care. What is your plan specifically? Well, as you said, we all know that social care is in crisis and there are millions of unpaid carers around the country who are picking up the pieces. So what we have said is that we're making a pledge for a very big and bold proposal to introduce free personal care for older people and disabled uh, adults who need support with the things like having a wash in the morning, helping them take their medication, getting out of bed and getting dressed for the day. These are the kind of things that people really, really need. And we know that around the country, there's currently around, well, more than a million people who have unmet um, care mm. needs. And how much will it cost, uh, Daisy? How much does the plan cost? Well, the Health Foundation has said that the overall cost would be about £6.2 billion. We know that the government's plans account for around uh, £3.7 billion of that. And that's why we are pledging an additional £2.7 billion on top of that to cover the additional cost that would be needed yeah. to meet this. And how are uh, you funding that? Well, we have said that we would reverse the conser Conservatives' tax cuts for the big banks. So in recent years, the Conservatives have given a really big giveaway to the big banks who are raking in billions of pounds in profits. And if we can reverse those uh, tax cuts of the big banks, then we can fully fund uh, this particular pledge. Well, except the Nuffield Trust, uh, the health think tank, suggests that the costing uh, that you've just outlined attached to both the personal care pledge and the vow that you're making to raise care workers' pay looks inadequate. What do you say? Well, I haven't seen their particular criticism, but as I say, we've done our research on this. Um, as I say, the Health Foundation does estimate it would cost about £6.2 billion, and our pledge uh, is additional money that would get us to that figure. Our, our, we actually think that our estimates are quite conservative in a way. They're quite cautious, because what we haven't factored in are the enormous savings that could be made to the NHS budget. Some people say more than mm. £3 billion pounds, uh, by actually making sure that this system is in place, because with a proper pledge of free personal care. You can support people to live with independence and dignity, preventing them from going to hospital in the first place yes. in many cases, but also helping them to get out of hospital when they no longer need to be there. And as you say, this is about caring for people in their home. Are you still expecting people to sell their homes to pay for residential adult social care? So what we've said is that this free personal care pledge would apply to everybody, whether they're in their own home or whether they're in a care home. But we have actually thrown down the gauntlet to all of the other political parties and said immediately after the general election, we need to have a cross-party commission come together, get around the table and agree a long-term funding plan for social care. All right. Well, that would be another one. I mean, there have been so many attempts by Conservatives and Labour to bring in a social care programme. Now, the BBC has been asking our viewers to get in touch with questions that they might have for politicians throughout the election campaign. Uh, one of them that came through the BBC's Your Voice, Your Vote, Ian Hogg from Derbyshire, wants to know, and Daisy, I'm going to put this um, to the Conservative candidate here and Minister Tom Perceglove, what additional funding are you going to provide for the care sector and for social Care. So everything that is in our manifesto will be costed and funded. And but will there be additional expected. money for the care well, sector? Well, we've put in place £9 billion extra for social care, focusing particularly on discharge and making sure that there is support available, particularly localised, tailored solutions to support... But there have been massive cuts, haven't there, to local authorities in terms of being able to provide social care? So, obviously, it's important that we put extra resource in. On the workforce side, big focus on retention, big focus on recruitment, but also that those sort of on-cost challenges, those day-to-day -day running costs, there is this additional £9 billion that's gone in. What I can't do is preempt what may be in the manifesto, but everything that we come forward with would build on those policy steps that we've already taken during the course of this part. But the Liberal Democrats are saying it's in crisis. What would Labour... Why isn't Labour making this front and central of their campaign, fixing social care? 
Well, I think it's good that Daisy's raised this, and I also agree with her that we need a cross-party approach, and that'll be a big thing for the... take another... Years and well, years, we've already had the but... Dilnock Commission. We had Gordon Brown with what Ultimately, the Conservatives called the death tax, then yeah. the dementia tax with Theresa May. I mean, we've been waiting for years. And it's even more urgent now, and I'm sure there will be something in it uh, on it in our manifesto. But I'm, I'm glad it's raised. It is put it onto the agenda. It's a huge issue for many people. But I think that... The only problem with the Lib Dems things, it just reminded me about when they promised to abolish tuition fees. Do you remember? They was like, and everybody was like, yay, let's abolish tuition fees. But actually, they, they didn't have a, a you know... Keir Starmer promised that's that, why... of course, in his leadership campaign, that's didn't he, right. to abolish tuition, tuition fees. fees. Yeah. Um, and that's been dropped. Briefly on the question, should Labour pledge significant amount of money to either go to local authorities or generally to help people with social care costs? Only if they can show where the money's coming from. People do not want recklessness in government such as we've had from the Tories. Well, just to give you a flavour of promises made, and then I'll get Moya and Tim to respond. Boris Johnson, uh, on the steps of Downing Street when he became Prime Minister in July 2019, said this. My job is to protect you or your parents or grandparents from the fear of having to sell your home to pay for the costs of care. And so I am announcing now on the steps of Downing Street, that we will fix the crisis in social care once and for all with a clear plan we have prepared to give every older person the dignity and security they deserve. Never happened, did it, Tim? No, it certainly didn't. Um, can I just respond, though, to what Daisy mm -hmm. has just been talking about? I don't think her numbers add up automatically, but I've recently spent um, 48 hours with a neighbour of mine who fell over repeatedly. And over the course of those 48 hours, I think I dealt with um, 14 NHS professionals. Mm, um, he's now been in hospital for over a week. He didn't need to be in hospital. He just needs to be looked mm. after. Mm. And so the gap, I think what Daisy was saying, the gap in her funding numbers, which is real, is really about relief of the pressure on the National Health Service. The thing is, the NHS at the moment is cleaning up the pieces mm. from a broken community, a broken uh, adult care sector, this has to be wow. an absolute number one priority. And, you know, if Labour can deliver this, Harriet, it's a huge advantage. What I don't get the impression, though, from Keir Starmer, he's aping a lot of Tory rhetoric on all sorts of issues. It was defence yesterday. Wow. No one really seems to be... I'm glad the Liberal Democrats have made the intervention they have today. Where is Labour on this? Because it doesn't seem to be the priority that it really should be. Should it be Labour's priority? And then I'll get Harriet I to think respond. It should absolutely be Labour's priority. And just in defence of Daisy, I think what she was talking about when she said, uh, you know, the NHS, it clears this big uh, bit in the budget, is she was talking about the beds. Uh, I, was, Ed I was basically Davey, agreeing yeah, with Daisy. Ed, Ed, that, Ed yeah. Davey had also said that earlier on the Today programme. But I, I agree with Tim. And let's Gosh, not get that shot. doesn't happen very often. I agree with Tim that I think the policies that are being outlined by the two dominant parties and Labour at the moment, obviously, you know, going to get a super majority as predicted by the polls. There is lots more room to outline a positive vision of what Britain could be beyond, you know, we're going to have more submarines that aren't going to affect how people actually live their day to day lives or, um, you know, we're going to bring down net migration and these endless bitter debates that we're having about why we should let people in the country when what's really happening is people like Tim's neighbour are falling over being passed around from person to person because there's nowhere to put them people are being treated in corridors the Royal College of Nursing we're talking about that just this week why is this not front and centre because neither of the two main parties can really be honest about the amount of money it would take mm. to fix this and what the Lib Dems are actually doing is making an effort and I don't think we're seeing that we're seeing a shying away from even making that effort from both Labour and the Tories, and it's, it's demoralising. Well, I think we will make an effort in government. Do you? I mean, because of the NHS, if but you win. also because if we win... Oh, God, there I go again. Um, oh. But I think uh, because of what Tim said, is it's, it's not an unreal fear that people have got. It's happening in people's families up and down the country, and I think there will be a real determination. But like well, Daisy said... It will have to be cross-party and it will have to be sustainable and well thought through. Nobody's going to thank us for making promises at this stage that we can't deliver. So that is why... But that sounds like you're not I'd... going to tackle it because... No, we, well, I think we are, but I would, you know, I'd say to Moya, it's, it's, it's really important when there's been such a breach of trust between the Tories and the public in terms of what they've promised and then what they've done. We have got to treat their confidence in us really like a precious thing. But do you and trust, not do you trust Labour if they win the election to do something on this? I don't. However, I, what I want to say is I agree with Harriet that the, the culture of pledgeocracy, as I call it, 
is um, one that has been run rampant. And that's one of the reasons there's so much alienation, distrust from voters in every party, because uh, leaders across the spectrum make constant pledges and then constantly revoke them when the circumstances change. However, I don't think it's the same thing as, you know, the Lib Dems are promising a costed policy, and there's been questions from Nuffield Trust about the costings, but mm. I, think, I think what they're doing is they're actually making an effort to say, here's our costings, here's our research. What Labour are doing is not saying anything on it at this point in time, and we can't trust the Tories to do it, because, frankly, they're probably not going to get into government, I, and when they previously promised on social care, they completely let us down. Yesterday was about Nigel Farage, but actually one of the most moving parts of the campaign yesterday was Ed Tavey talking yeah. about the care mm. of his son. Yeah. And mm. one of the reasons why I believe the Lib Dems are serious about this is because I think for Ed Davey, it's, it's personal. personal. Mm. Yes. And sometimes that can be communicated in a way that few other policies can be. I mean, Daisy, in a way, since Tim's brought it up, um, it is personal to Ed Davey. He's talked extensively about the importance of care across the society and he has very personal experience of it. That juxtaposed, and we can show you the pictures from yesterday, I think you were on the boat that was sailing past um, in Henley. I mean, you're laughing away, but, the, you know, that next to the very... There it is behind uh, uh, Rishi Sunak, photobombing him there. Um, yeah, it's funny, but does that really... Does it sort of jar when you're then talking about really difficult issues of social care? Daisy? No, I don't think it does jar, because we've been very clear that um, whilst we don't take ourselves very seriously, we do take our politics very seriously. And as Tim said, no one could have watched that interview with Ed Davey yesterday and not felt a real pang in their heart. Um, it was incredibly, incredibly raw, incredibly powerful. And I would say to every single person around the country who has an experience of being a carer, they do it through an enormous abundance of love. But flipping heck, is it a tough job to do. Um, many people know what that experience is like. Every single Member of Parliament in the last four and a half years will have had some very, very distressing cases of older people or disabled people not receiving the care that they desperately need and the consequences of that. This issue cannot be ignored anymore. Liberal Democrats are putting it front and centre of our campaign and we're throwing down the gauntlet to every other political party to come up with some good ideas too. All right, Daisy Cooper, thank you very much. You can see there, uh, Jenga bricks, looks like a blue wall, um, Tom, being knocked down there on a campaign visit by the Liberal Democrats. Uh, leader Ed Davey. Um, talking about the election, we already know that 133 now former MPs are not going to stand again. Um, it feels like there is a real changing of the guard. Um, what's your response to losing so much experience, potentially, um, well, not potentially, there are those who are standing down and possibly losing their seats in this election? Well, actually, when you look at it, there are a lot of colleagues, very good friends of mine, in fact, someone like Chris Eaton Harris, who's given 25 years of service in frontline politics. That is a very long time. Um, with all of the pressures and the impacts on families, someone like Will Quince, again, a very, very dear colleague and friend of mine who's got a young family, wants to spend more time with them, completely understandable. But also people like Holly Lynch on the Labour side, who I've worked with in different roles over the years, have enormous respect and admiration for it. She's decided to step back. So there are a lot of good people. It is a difficult job. Right. Challenge you're looking, looking really sceptical, but there are quite... You're, sta you're like standing down. Do you really want to stand down when you think there's going to be a landslide? It's, I, I feel the Labour Party's in safe hands, so I'm safe ah. to stand down. But I would say, you know, in response to what Tom said, is that there has been, what, 80 Labour MPs, uh, Tory MPs standing down, and they're not standing down because they've done 25 years of service. Well, they they're, done, they're standing down because they think they're going to lose and they don't want to fight and lose, All and right. they've given up in despair, whereas... A few people have stood down from Labour Quite for individual reasons. Let, but well, not because they've given up on the party. Well, let me just show... Uh, in fact, loads of people are trying to get in to be Labour candidates, which is rather the opposite of the problem that Rishi Sunak's got. Well, um, of course, Diane Abbott's had a bit of a battle, hasn't she, uh, trying to stand in the seat she's represented. She is uh, running. She says she is going to stand. Um, what do you think of her treatment by the Labour Party? Well, I think two things at the same time. I mean, you know, I've got an enormous amount of respect and admiration for Diane, and I think we only know the half of what she has put up with being the first black woman MP. And she has been a trailblazer, and we now have many black Labour women MPs and, indeed, women on all sides of the House. But I'd also say being a, in the party is something about working as a team. And nobody has got an actual right. I, w I, I do think Diane has got a right to stand, and hopefully oh. she will stand. 
But aside from that, I would say... She is. The Labour she's Party definitely standing. Well she's definitely leadership. standing. Oh, she's definitely standing. She wasn't treated very well by your leadership. Yeah, you can see I... it here in the Independent Diana, but to stand to be hackney yeah. Labour MP as Starmer's Labour confirms candidates. But I, I think that, basically, I wouldn't want people to think that... Um, that well, I, I, you know, I hope she will be standing and she, the, the NEC will approve her today, hopefully. But there are... There are she's blazed a trail and there are more black and Asian women right. MPs. But, actually, if you're in a party, ultimately, you have to work to change that party. I want to change that party on... this party on women All right. and on black people well, okay. and Asian but people. Moya, she is, but she is got standing. To do it from within. She is standing. And I she's been that's... approved by the oh, NEC. There has been a massive really good. story missed here which is about the selections process. Mm -hmm. So the guard is changing, but the question is, how are the people being selected who are coming through? And both on the Conservative and Labour sides are two dominant parties. There are huge questions about how fair um, these, election, these selection processes are. For example, I was talking to journalist Michael Crick yesterday, who has been closely following these election, selection processes, and he actually called the standing down of several Labour MPs corruption. Uh, in the manner in which they have resigned, which is a big claim to make, and he is someone who identifies as being on the Labour right of the party. Mm -hmm. Now, what's happened in some of these selection processes is people have resigned at the last minute. So, you know, in Blair's day, they did this too, and sometimes they received peerages later. But what is also happening... Just by coincidence. Yeah. What is also happening is that the Labour head office and the NEC changed the rules last year so that they could parachute people into seats as candidates without consulting the local constituency parties. So you now have some of the leaders of the most secretive think tanks yes. in Labour parachuting the safer seats in, Labour in, in the country. Well, what do you make of that? Well, I would say that Keir Starmer and the NEC have got a responsibility to make sure in every single constituency there is somebody who is right for public service, Why right for being Essex a Labour... Why when they've never been? Well, twas well, ever, twas ever thus, I you could have say, got, of you course... Could good, you could why say... They, why is he on. sits in the NEC being approved We've by the NEC to stand as a Labour candidate without any consultation from a local party? Is it a good look? I don't look? know about the... I'll tell you what is a good look. I'll tell you what is a good look, is that we have got a fantastic team of candidates, and you will be really pleased with... All of our, not all of them, but most of our candidates. <laughs> Moya. I'm I'm some, Moya Moya well, let me ask him. Let me ask really him about. Let me. Candidate. I know. Let's ask oh. Tim. You tweeted this: and Gove, Wallace, Javid, May, Redwood, Zahawi, Ledson, Cash, Clark, all former ministers and former prime minister, all stepping down. We're witnessing an absolutely massive changing of the guard. What impact is it going to have? Look, we're sat here with one of the most influential parliamentarians of the modern era, Harriet Harman. What she did with the Equalities Act, I didn't agree with it. She, uh, not all of it, anyway. But you, you left your mark on politics to a huge extent. I reckon if you were part of the Labour team now, you'd be a more effective minister than you were a few years ago because you were, you've all your lessons. What the Conservative Party and Labour Party are going to experience, I think, after the next election, is such an, a, a parliament of novices, people who haven't been round the block once or twice, who haven't learned how to run a department. Of course you need sort of new blood. You need people with new ideas. Sure. But you need to balance that with people who know how to run very complex Whitehall departments. And the I Conservative bet Party... Be well, and the Conservative now, Party, what impact is it going to have for losing all this well, experience? Well, it's going to mean that young MPs will make mistakes more often because they won't have those conversations in the tea room on the back benches with colleagues who've made those mistakes before. Of course, everyone has to make their own mistakes in a way, and different generations make their own uh, different mistakes. But that lack of knowledge, that lack of experience, I think is going to mean the next parliament is going to be much more dangerous than the recent parliaments, simply I because there isn't that bedrock of knowledge. I don't Very be, briefly. I think it would be more dangerous, but the people being parachuted in are not new young MPs. A lot of them are people who've surrounded these parties for years as lobbyists, as think tank directors, as special advisers. And you don't think that that is going to be productive? For I the don't part. think it'd be productive when it's a lot of people who haven't shown any great genius for politics instead of showing great genius for networking and changing hands with I money. I mean, if you look, for example, I just I think you can relax, Tim. I think it's going to be absolutely fine. Rachel well, Reeves has been. <laughs> Rachel Reeves has been almost heading for the chancellorship since she was about 14. Right. Uh, Keir Starmer is a serious person, and I can tell you, you don't need to lie awake at night in your bed. They will be a cracking. Will you accept if, a period? Would you, will you accept in. a peerage? I have said I would if I were lucky enough to be offered one. Oh, so you, you would go into the House of Lords. You step down. Whether they will accept peerages? Uh, nobody. Goodbye from all of us here. <laughs> bye bye. <laughs>